Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My brothers and sisters in Islam, we have with us today uh, a very beautiful, very, very powerful, very energetic, very supercharged surah. Uh, it's a surah which a lot of people love to recite, uh, and there are numerous ahadith about it, some of them of questionable authenticity, though uh, due to the presence of a lot of these ahadith, uh, a lot of the Muslim Ummah particularly take a lot of attention to this, uh, to this surah. This is Surah Yaseen, uh, which is the surah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, and this was of course revealed in Makkah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to us about the validity of the messengership of Muhammad sallam, about the akhirah and the resurrection, and about faith and iman in this Qur'an. This, uh, this surah, as the scholars of Islam mention, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continuously goes around these three topics again and again. So at one point he'll mention how Muhammad sallallahu is definitely a right prophet, how this Qur'an is definitely the best of books and, the, and, a, valid, uh, and a valid book that they should all take, take and pay attention to. And number three, how the Day of Judgment is going to come and it is going to be so difficult upon those who disbelieve in this Qur'an. In this surah, uh, there's a number of, uh, about this surah, there's a number of hadith that are reported. So there's a hadith that is reported, which is in, in Musnad Imam Ahmed, also reported by uh, Abu Dawood, as well as other books of the Sunan, where the Prophet Wasallam had said, uh, was reported to have said that Yasin is the heart of the Qur'an. Uh, this hadith is not authentic. It is not authentic according to the majority of the scholars of hadith. Um, so to say that, that Yasin is the heart of the Qur'an, there is no real authentic evidence regarding it. There is another hadith, uh, which is also reported in Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi, and also in Mustadi Ibn Ahmed, and in Dara Qutni and others, where Rasulullah is reported to have said, uh, read upon your dead Surah Yasin. Um, if this hadith is authentic, and a minority of scholars have said it is authentic, if this hadith is authentic, it does not mean read it to your dead. It means read it to those people who are about to die. Okay? It means read it to those people who are about to die. Because there is no authentic evidence at all of reading the Qur'an to the dead people. If someone has passed away, you do not read the Qur'an to them. You read the Qur'an to people who are alive. Because those who have passed away have passed away. The Sahaba never ever read Surah Yasin to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on his dead body, for example. The Sahaba never read Surah Yasin to the grave of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So all of these practices are innovated and mistaken practices. Misunderstanding of this hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The hadith states, read it to those who are about to die. Yeah? Mautakum does not have to mean dead. It can also mean those who are on the wishkal maut. Ala wishkal maut meaning they're about to pass away. So they're almost dead. So basically, why do you read Surah Yasin to them? It is to remind them of the three most important things which they are going to be asked about, right? Which is, what is your religion? Who is this Lord? And who is this man that came to you? He's going to be asked these questions in our grave. So these three questions, the answer of it in a very powerful way is in this beautiful Surah, Surah Yasin. It is for this reason why this was mentioned. Ala <coughs> kulli from the guidance of the Sunnah Ikhwani, my brothers and sisters of Islam, for those who are passing away, and especially at the point of passing away, is to only ask them to say, La ilaha illallah. What we do today is when people are passing away, people tend to encourage them to say, Say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, Say Qudullah wa Allah wa Samad. Yani we, we are lost at what to tell people when they're passing away. When they're passing away, or, or before that, if you believe this hadith to be authentic, then it is to recite Surah Yaseen. But at the point of death, at the point of death, which is when he is passing away, the only last thing he should say is La ilaha illallah, that's it. Not even up to Muhammad Rasulullah. In fact, the hadith states, Man kana akhiru kalamihi la ilaha illallah, dakhal al jannah. Whoever his last statement was La ilaha illallah, then he enters jannah. And because it is a matter of the unseen, we restrict ourselves to what the hadith states. The hadith states, La ilaha illallah, up to there, right? 
we don't even finish off the kalima. So therefore, as our ulama used to encourage, when someone is passing away, encourage them to say up to la ilaha illallah and then do not ask them to say any more. Keep quiet. Let that be the last word that you ever utter in this dunya. Not that you keep on saying la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. No, no. Just tell them to recite only once. And anyway, that, that topic inshallah can be discussed another time when we talk about uh, Janaza and its rulings and what to tell people to do when they are passing away inshallah. However, this surah, and I only mention it because people like to recite this surah at the time of death and because of the presence of that hadith. This surah is, uh, is one, of the, uh, one of the surahs that the Prophet ﷺ used to love to recite given the fact that it contains uh, extremely powerful imagery and extremely powerful speeches about from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the greatness of this Quran, about the Akhirah, and about Rasulullah sallallahu And again and again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes back to it. In fact the linguistic imagery of the Quran in this surah is exquisite. And it is a shame that I won't be able to explain some of them that I, ha that I can understand with my limited knowledge. But subhanAllah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to learn the Arabic language, to understand the beauty of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us in this surah. Let's take the surah inshallah and it will become slowly clear the imagery and the powerful of it. In the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala initially talks about how this Quran is a wise Quran that was revealed to a true prophet and he is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thereafter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on to talking about those people who try to harm the Prophet and those who deny his prophethood and try to harm the Prophet. They are the people who Allah has, to, has put their hands tied to their necks and who, uh, uh, and who uh, uh, have a barrier in front of them, a barrier behind them so they cannot see. And this is in reference to Abu Jahl. We're going to come to that, the story of Abu Jahl and about the story of uh, the Makhzumiya who were the people with Abu Jahl who wanted to kill Rasulullah as he was prostrating. Because Abu Jahl, he intended to kill Rasulullah by throwing a brick or a boulder on his head whilst he was prostrating near the Kaaba. So these surahs were revealed regarding them. Uh, these verses were revealed regarding them. Then thereafter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how Allah created life and death and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will count what deeds we did in this dunya and also the effect of those deeds. And as some of the scholars said, the effect of the deeds is in reference to people and they're walking towards, towards their masjids. Other scholars mentioned this is in reference to your children. We're going to come to that inshallah tafsir of that. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on to talk about a story of a man by the name of Habib bin Musa al-Najjar. Habib bin Musa al-Najjar was a righteous man in one of the cities called the city of Antaqiyya. In Arabic it's called Antaqiyya. In English, it is known as Antioch, the city of Antioch. The city of Antioch is a city which is in Greater Syria, where the Greater Syria that we know. There is a city called Antioch. It was ruled by the Romans before uh, the coming of Isa salam. After Isa came, whilst the, whilst the Prophet Isa salam was there, he sent a couple of messengers, two messengers and then a third one, to the city of Antioch. Some scholars have differences whether the city in reference is in the city of Antioch or not. We're going to come to that a bit later. So Allah talks about the story of these two messengers and the third one that came, that came to this town. And then the people in the town, they disbelieved. Some of them disbelieved, others believed. And the, and the messengers brought miracles with them. They, would, uh, some, they brought some of the miracles of Isa alayhi salam. They would uh, heal the leper. They could give uh, sometimes life back to the dead. Some of them... Some of them mention uh, stories of somehow some of these messengers had miracles that they brought with them, which were the miracles of Isa salam, that Isa salam, had shared with them. So people disbelieved. They did not believe in these messengers. So Allah gave a third one. Still they didn't believe. Then finally this man by the name of Habib bin Musa al-Najjar, who used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, living inside a cave, came running from the farthest part of the village, ordering people to to listen to the two messengers. And the amazing thing is that the explanation of Habib al-Najjar, why people should listen to the messengers is very, very beautiful. It's very wise, very logical, and very beautiful, inshallah. So we're going to come to that in the second page of this beautiful surah, inshallah. In the third page, uh, and then towards the end of the, of the first, of the, of the second page, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Habib al-Najjar 
Habib bin Musa Najjar was some subsequently grabbed by the people. The people grabbed him. Some scholars mentioned that they tore him apart, meaning they ripped his limbs apart by tying him to horses and then making the horses rip, rip his limbs apart. Some said they cut his head off. Some said they burnt him alive. They tortured him basically very badly, right? They tortured Habib bin Musa Najjar very, very badly before killing him. And when he died, then he entered Jannah because he was a, he was a shaheed. So Allah quotes what Habib al Najjar said when he passed away, which is, oh, oh, how I wish my people would know how Allah has honored me and given me and forgiven me and given me this great, beautiful Jannah as a reward, right? So Habib al Najjar, Habib bin Musa al Najjar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions him here uh, as a recommendation for all of us to be like him as well, being firm on our faith, just like the faith of Habib bin Musa al Najjar. Then finally, Inshallah, I'm not going to be able to take all of the surah. I'm only going to take the first third of the surah, so it will take us almost three days to finish the surah, Inshallah. In the uh, in in the third page, in the top of the, of that page, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will talk about how Allah destroyed this town of Antioch. Though it has not been reported that Antioch was ever destroyed, perhaps it's a part of Antioch, perhaps it's another town near Antioch. Only Allah knows. Uh, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that after they killed Habib bin Musa al-Najjar, then Allah destroyed this town with a single blast, meaning sound. By the power of sound, Allah destroyed this town totally. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has destroyed many other towns like this, uh, if they did not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're going to take only up to this today in Surah Yaseen. Inshallah, sit back, uh, bring out the surah, have it available with you in front of you and follow through as we take the meanings of the surah. Every single sentence and every single verse has so much meaning, so much power in it. And I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares its wisdom and its benefit with you today, inshaAllah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah ar-Rahman, the one who is generally merciful, ar-Rahim, the one who is specifically merciful to believers. Yaseen. Yaseen, the scholars have said many different meanings behind it. The first opinion states that Yaseen, Yaseen means the Qur'an. The first opinion states Yaseen means the Qur'an. And in fact, Ibn Kathir rahimullah, mentions 15 opinions regarding what Yaseen means. So some of the scholars said Yaseen means the Qur'an. Other scholars said Yaseen means Ya Nas. Ya Nas. So therefore sometimes in the Arabic language out of poetry and out of beauty, instead of actually saying all of the letters, only some of the letters of these phrases and words are mentioned. So Ya Seen, meaning Ya, instead of the Ya and the Alif, Allah only mentions the Ya. And instead of the an Nas, which is Noon Alif Seen, Allah mentions only the Seen. As if it's already understood that Allah is referring to Ya Nas. Other scholars said, no, here, the Nas that is being intended is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why they said Ya Seen means Ya Muhammad. Wallahu ta'ala alam, this does not seem to be the strongest opinion. The stronger opinion seems to be what Ibn Kathir said, which is the strongest opinion about all of these letters. Yaseen, Alif, Lam, Mim, Ha, Mim, Qaf, Ayn, Ayn, Kaf, Ha, Ya, Ayn, Saad, etc. All of these letters, the strongest opinion, inshallah, is what Ibn Kathir rahimahullah says, is that they all refer back to the Qur'an, because right after it, very, very next verse refers back to the Qur'an. So, the next Sentence says, Wal Quran al Hakim, meaning I swear by the Quran, which is Al Hakim, which is Al Hakim, meaning the wise, the most wise. Because the Quran has been called the Hakim and Allah's name is Al Hakim, it shows the Quran is not created. It shows that the Quran is not created, that it is, it is from Allah, and if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not created, Quran is not created. So anything which is from Allah directly, which is from His attributes, His speech, therefore is eternal. Therefore the Qur'an has always existed eternally. It is not as people say that, or some people said, like the Mu'tazila said, that the Qur'an is created. No. Well, Qur'an al-Hakim, and the Qur'an which is al-Hakim, which is full of wisdom. Innaka lamin al-Mursaleen. Verily you are from the messengers. Verily, O oh you, O oh Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you are from the messengers. And the reason why 
by the way, because this third verse says, Innaka, verily you are, that's why some of the scholars of Tafsir said Yasin refers to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, the stronger understanding is that right after a mention, the very next verse is what explains the verse before. So if it refers to Quran, actually Yasin, a better understanding is that it refers to the Quran, Allah knows best. Innaka la min al Indeed, O Muhammad Sallallahu you are from the Messenger. Why did Allah Zawajal have to say that, that indeed you are from the Messenger when it was known? It was said that he said that Allah said this because the disbelievers of Quraysh, they said, Lasta Mursala, you are not a messenger. So when they said, Lasta Mursala, you are not a messenger, Allah refuted them and said, rather you are from the messengers. You are definitely a messenger of God. Ala sirati mustaqim, you are upon the sirat, which is the path mustaqim that is straight and upright. Sirat, which is path. Mustaqim meaning straight and upright. So the Quran is Sirat al Mustaqim. The religion of Islam is Sirat al Mustaqim. The Prophet Sunnah is Sirat al Mustaqim. It is a straight path. Yeah? And this is the hadi and the guidance of Rasulullah towards a straight path. Sirat al Mustaqim. Tanzil al Aziz al Rahim. Sirat al Mustaqim also refers to the Quran. Some of the scholars mention Sirat al Mustaqim, the meaning of it could be. The Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ could be Islam, and third meaning could be the Quran. And the proof of that is the very next verse, which is Tanzil al Aziz al Rahim, meaning this Quran is Tanzil from al Aziz al Rahim, the Aziz meaning the honored one, which is Allah al Rahim, which is the one who is most merciful, the most honored, most merciful God who has sent something down from Himself, which is this Quran, which happens to be Sirat al Mustaqim. لِتُنذِرَ قَوْمًا مَا أُنذِرَ آبَاؤُهُمْ فَهُمْ غَافِلُونَ He has sent this Qur'an down, تَنزِيلٌ مِنْ عَزِيزِ الرَّحِيمِ لِتُنذِرَ Lam over here means in order, meaning Lam al-Ta'leel, which means in order, the reason why. So why was this Qur'an revealed? لِتُنذِرَ In order that you may do inzar. Inzar means to warn. لِتُنذِرَ meaning so that you may warn uh, قَوْمًا A people مَا أُنذِرَ آبَاؤُهُمْ Ma over here has two meanings. It, it may mean that ma unzir abahum meaning ma nafia lil jins, which means to all warn a people whose forefathers were never warned. And whose forefathers were never warned? The Quraysh, because Quraysh had never had a prophet sent to them. Right? So it's a reference over here to the Quraysh, because Quraysh never had a prophet sent to them. So litunzira qawma ma unzira abahum. Over here ma means la or lam. So, to warn a people whose people, whose forefathers were never warned, فَهُمْ غَافِلُونَ As a result, they are ghafil, meaning they are completely unaware, completely lost, and completely oblivious to the truth of what is being proposed here. The other meaning of ma over here could mean, could mean uh, مَا أُنذِرَ أَبَاؤُهُمْ Meaning that, meaning الَّذِي Meaning that which their forefathers were already warned about. Yeah? You have been sent to a people in order to warn those people who were already warned, meaning the forefathers were already warned about the coming of this messenger and about the, the, the meanings of this Qur'an. فَهُمْ غَافِلُونَ Verily, indeed, they are people that are oblivious to the truth. لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ This is a very important verse. It says that indeed, the haq, meaning the truth, has already been established upon the majority of them, so they will never ever believe. Meaning, Allah has closed their hearts to guidance. So they will never ever believe. Their fate is sealed. They are, they are headed to Jahannam. The only thing left is for them to die. And when they die, they are going to head to Jahannam. Some people on this earth, Allah has already established the haq upon them. Ya ikhwati, sometimes, sometimes, a person may say a word which angers Allah so much, which angers Allah so much that He will completely close your door to guidance and hidayah. And sometimes a person may say a word which Allah loves so much that He will write for you forgiveness and mercy and entry into Jannah despite all other sins that you do after it. So it's really important. How do you know when will Allah do that? Well, you see, this is why you have to be very wary of that which is wrong and stay away from it. So one of the things, for example, that makes Allah angry, as an example, is 
mockery. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates mockery, especially of Islamic things. In fact, many a times when people mock Allah or mock his deen or mock his prophet or mock his Quran or mock anything about Islam, like calling masjids, oh, what a tiny masjid that is. Or for example, saying, oh, uh, you know, you Muslim men, all you do is eat and, and uh, you know, have big bellies. Or, oh, Muslim sisters, for example, oh, you guys are just like Darth Vader, just, you know, cover yourself. Mockery is something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not tolerate. Yeah? And because of mockery, Allah might destroy a person, or write for him completely that his fate is sealed. On the other hand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves praise. Allah loves dua. Allah loves dhikr. So it may be because of a praise or a dua or a dhikr that you do for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will write for you forgiveness forever, forever and ever until the day of judgment. In fact, it was reported in an authentic hadith that Rasulullah and his companions were walking down a road. They came past the house of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Ibn Mas'ud. And when they were passing by the house of Ibn Mas'ud, they heard Ibn Mas'ud making dua to Allah. What were they saying? What was Ibn Mas'ud saying? Ibn Mas'ud was praising Allah copiously. In the most amazing way, Ibn Mas'ud was copiously praising Allah. And then at that point, Rasulullah stopped. He heard Ibn Mas'ud making dua and copiously praising Allah. Just, Allah, you are so great. Allah, you are so amazing. Allah, you are so, you are so fantastic. Allah, you are so perfect. Just copiously praising Allah. And then the Prophet kept on hearing, hearing, hearing. And then he said, ask him, he will give you. He said quietly. So the other companions heard Ibn Mas'ud didn't hear. He was behind the hut. So Ibn Mas'ud, right after at that point, he said, Oh Allah, I ask you for mercy on the day of judgment, for forgiveness from Jahannam. And I ask you to be the companion of Muhammad Wasallam in Jannah. Okay? So at that point, Rasulullah said, He has been given, he has been given. Meaning he has been given what he asked for, he has been given what he asked for. So Ikhwati, sometimes, sometimes we may end up saying a word which could throw us into Jahannam for a distance of thousand years of travel. Or sometimes we could say a word which could make Allah so happy that could take us into Jannah, you know, for a thousand years travel, inshallah. Tayyib Ikhwani, how do you know what to do? This is why my advice to you is to take advantage of the best of times. Like what? Like for example, Ramadan, like the nights of Ramadan, like the days of the 10 days of the Hijjah, like the day of Arafat, right? Take advantage, like when it rains. These are times where Rasulullah said, Allah accepts dua. So take advantage of these times and make the haqq, which is Jannah, be applicable to you. And Allah will write for you that, and He will not get angry with you ever again. وَجَعَلْنَا لَقَدْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ عَلَىٰ أَكْثَرِهِمْ The truth has been established on majority of them. فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ So they will never ever believe. إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ أَغْلَالًا Verily we have put in their anaq, in their necks, أَغْلَال فَهِيَ إِلَى الْأَذْقَانِ أَغْلَال meaning locks. فَهِيَ إِلَى الْأَذْقَانِ So the locks reach the chin. فَهُمْ مُقْمَحُونَ So they have raised necks looking down. What does it mean? Let me explain. So some locks, have you seen some locks? Have you seen those um, uh, certain tribes in the Arabian, uh, in, in Africa? They like long, long necks. So what do they do? They put these, <laughs> these chains around their necks, okay? especially on their women. They like women with long necks. I don't know why. Okay? Who knows? You know, it's a fetish, I guess. But anyway, they, they put these huge locks around their necks. So Allah says that, Allah has put around these people huge locks around their necks that reach up to the chin. Locks are so thick and big and wide. It's up to their chin. So as a result, they're having to be like this. They're having to. If they want to look down, they have to look like this. Does, anyone, does it make sense? So qamaha, qamaha means when a, when a camel is looking for water. Right? Meaning qamaha al-ibl. Meaning the camel has lifted its neck up, looking very far and wide, and is looking so far and wide, it's also trying to look down, and it's so therefore, it's, it's looking like this, meaning lowering its eyes. فَهُمْ مُقْمَحُونَ إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا فِي أَعْنَاكِهِمْ أَغْلَالًا فَهِيَ إِلَى الْأَذْقَانِ To the chins, فَهُمْ مُقْمَحُونَ They're only able to look like this. 
The scholars said this means that Allah has put locks around their necks so they're not able to turn to the hidayah of the guidance of Muhammad Sallallahu when it does come to them. Other scholars said no, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has tied their neck, their hands to their necks, their hands to their necks, meaning that Allah has put their deeds and with their necks together, they are not able to now go and accept Islam, nor are they able to turn towards the hidayah and guidance when the hidayah and guidance comes to them. The scholars of Islam said, of Tafsir said that this verse was revealed regarding Abu Jahl. Because Abu Jahl, he came to Rasulullah, he came uh, one day and he said, I'm going to kill Muhammad. And he saw Muhammad praying near the Kaaba. He got very angry. So what did he do? He took a boulder. Okay? He took a boulder like this. And then he came near Muhammad. And then what did he do? As he was coming close, he was lifting it up. As he was lifting the boulder up, his hands became paralyzed and stuck to that position. He could not move. So all he could do is just drop the boulder and the boulder just dropped in front of him. And of course he could not get to Rasulullah So he came to these people who were his friends, the Makhzumiyah, and he told them what happened, meaning, oh my God, I put this boulder and my hands could not move. Right? I just couldn't feel my hands. And hands couldn't move. It felt like my hands were stuck to my necks. So as a result, as a result, this, uh, 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 this surah was, this verse was in reference to him. So one of the Makhzumiyah, one of the children of the Makhzumiyah, what he did was, he said, okay, then I'm gonna go kill him. So what did he do? He took, he took a knife, a sword, and he said that he was going to cut Muhammad Sallallahu neck off as he was prostrating. So as he reached in front and he went to the Kaaba, he simply couldn't find him. Where is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi He's not there. Where is he? Actually, he was in front of him, right there in front of him. But he could not see. And so the scholars of Tafsir said the second verse was revealed regarding the Makhzumiyah. What was it? The fact that, وَجَعَلْنَا مِن بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدًّا وَمِن خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ And we put a cover in front of them, and we put a cover behind them, and we covered them up so he could not see at all. Right? So this was revealed regarding the Makhzumiyah. وَجَعَلْنَا And we have put مِن بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ In front of them وَمِن خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا Sadda means like a cover or a protective layer. وَمِن خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا And behind them a sadda, a protective cover. فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ So we covered them up. فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ So they cannot see. They could not see. Ya khwati, this, this verse is very powerful. Because this verse was, was recited by Rasulullah at the time of Hijrah. At the time of Hijrah, when Rasulullah as you know, he told the people, it's time, Allah says, do Hijrah. One after the other started leaving, except Rasulullah and Abu Bakr were the last to leave, correct? So Abu Bakr was preparing to leave. At that time, Rasulullah was in his hut. And the Quraysh had already gathered together, they had decided, that they were going to kill Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How were they going to kill? Each one of the tribes of the Banu Hashim were going to strike his neck together at the same time so that no one could ever Quraysh, uh, so that uh, uh, in, uh, the, the tribe of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could not ask for blood money, could not ask for them. They, only, they would have to ask for blood money because they couldn't fight all the tribes together. So they came, they came outside the hut of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put Ali with his rida, with his with his cover on top on the bed, and then he started reciting, "Wajalna min bayni aydihim saddan, wa min khalfihim saddan, fa agshaynahum fa hum la yubsirun." So he simply walked out in front of them, in front of these people who had come to murder him, and these people did not even notice Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as he simply walked off in front of them. Al Qurtubi rahimahullah in his tafsir mentions that once it also happened to Qurtubi that he had some enemies. They wanted to kill Qurtubi. Qurtubi is a great mufassir of the Qur'an. He said, once in my life, I was also stuck in a house where I had some enemies that were surrounding the house, some robbers that came. And I also started reciting this verse. And I escaped and no one ever recognized me. Yes, salam. It's a very powerful verse. وَجَعَلْنَا مِن بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدًّا We have put a covering in front of them, covering behind them. And we covered them up with this covering so they could not ever see. فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ وَسَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ And it is equal, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, عَلَيْهِمْ upon them. أَأَنذَرْتَهُمْ If you warn them, أَوْ أَمْ لَمْ تُمْذِرْهُمْ Or you don't warn them. 
la yu'minun, they'll never believe. Meaning, the, the statement has been sealed, their hearts have been sealed, it's finished. Whether you want them or you don't want them, it's not going to continue. فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ إِنَّمَا تُنْذِرُ مَنِ اتَّبَعَ الذِّكْرَ وَخَشْيَ الرَّحْمَانَ بِالْغَيْبِ Rather, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the one you should be warning is the one who follows the command, the dhikr, the, the, the reminder. وَخَشْيَ الرَّحْمَانَ بِالْغَيْبِ And the one who fears Allah in secret. The one who fears Allah in the depths of night. The one who fears Allah in his house. Because it's very easy to fear Allah in front of each other. But it's difficult to fear Allah when we are alone with our families or we are alone on our own. And that is the fear that matters. That is the fear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. فَبَشِّرْهُ بِمَغْفِرَةٍ Then give them the glad tidings of mercy وَأَجِرٍ kareem And a noble reward which is Jannah. إِنَّا Verily us, نَحْنُ Verily it is we, نُحْيِ الْمَوْتَى We give life to the dead. وَنَقْتُبُوا مَا قَدَّمُوا And we will write down what every human being has done, قَدَّمُوا What they have done or put forward as, as deeds. وَآثَارَهُمْ And the effect of the deeds. Ibn Abbas رضي الله تعالى عنه said, this verse means that Allah will write down in our books everything we have done and the athar and the best of our athar is our children. Right? That means whatever we do and whatever our children do will be written in our books. So subhanAllah, it's an amazing verse, very powerful. That means if your children are misguided and you have not told them to be guided, then you will feel their punishment and their pain too. Subhanallah. How many of us, subhanallah, you know, our, our, our families never bothered to teach us anything about Islam. What a danger that is. That not only will they feel their pain, but the pain of their children on the Day of Judgment as well, because they never ordered them to fear Allah Zawajal. Right? On the other hand, imagine if you trained your children, made them righteous, ulama of Islam, scholars, struggling for the deen, working for Allah's cause, then subhanAllah that day will come when you will also benefit from whatever they do in this dunya as well. Okay? Some of the scholars said, atharahum means that whatever is the effect of their deeds, meaning they applied the hadith of Rasulullah which is, man sanna sunnatan hasana, falahu ajruhu wa ajru man amila biha ila yawm al-qiyamah. Whoever does a good sunnah, then he will have that, the reward of that deed and the reward of whoever does that deed until the day of judgment. So for example, if I have ikhlas and I've told you guys let's do the tafsir of the Qur'an, I get the reward of my tafsir of the Qur'an plus the reward of all of you listening until the day of judgment, whoever benefits from it, if I have ikhlas. If I don't have ikhlas, then subhanAllah, this will be punishment upon punishment upon adab upon adab. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep my intention pure. Does that make sense, Ikhwani? Right. In the same way, if you do a good deed, like for example, our brother Iswan, for example, he's part of a project called NMC, New Muslim Care. So if he now starts this sunnah of this new project, and he looks after this project, and he does it right, yeah, and he encourages people to join, then whoever will join until the Day of Judgment, if this project continues to the Day of Judgment, he continues to benefit from it because it is the athar of his deeds. Does that make sense, everyone? Right. So this is the athar. This is why it is so amazing. Good deeds. Our Lord is so amazing, so merciful for us that He not only benefits us to one good deed, but anyone who does it. So the one who built this masjid, for example, not only gets the reward of the masjid and his building, will get a paradise and he'll get a house better than it in Jannah, but also he gets the reward of whoever does whatever in this masjid ila yawm al qiyamah Amazing, isn't it? So it's, this is why, ikhwati, be the first to do good deeds, and be the first to do big good deeds, big ones, massive ones, that people benefit from, because you will then benefit from all the good deeds that are done, because of your deed until the day of judgment. Right? So ikhwani, this is why da'wah is so great. Da'wah doesn't mean just da'wah to non-Muslims, da'wah to Muslims. This is why teaching knowledge is so great. Because whoever teaches knowledge, he will not only benefit from that himself, but also whoever does anything according to the knowledge until the Day of Judgment. 
So Ikhwani, get involved in Islamic da'wah early. They said, you know, I read an article the other day that Warren Buffett said, he said, if anyone invested $50 when Coke, Coca-Cola, right? Coca-Cola originally came out or, st or became uh, on the stock market, which is when? 1919. Which of course, yani, who, the, who's, <laughs> who would remember to invest $50 in something called Coke at that time? But if you did, your money would be worth $50 million right, right now. $49 million, okay. A little bit less. $49 million right now. $50 would be worth $49 million now. Right? In the same way, a deed that we do now, can you imagine how much more it will be worth on the Day of Judgment? Because not only will it be multiplied 10 times to 700 times, but also all of the deeds of the people who do that deed based upon the benefit of that action. Does that make sense? And this is why, Ikhwani, it is very important to help others and do good deeds early, 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 so that you can, you, your deeds multiply. And how many of us have the barakah to have our good deeds continue to the Day of Judgment? I mean, not everyone is like Bukhari, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, excuse me. <clears throat> not everyone is like Bukhari, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, whose books are read even till now, right? Well, whose books are read even till now, so, we, so he gets the ajr. Many of us, perhaps our knowledge will die with us because our ikhlas is not strong enough. Many of us, perhaps our deeds will die with us because we never did anything special for Allah. Many of us, our children will forget us soon after we die. Many of us, you know, we will never have a legacy. This is why for many of us, the earlier, the earlier you do it, the more chances you have of benefiting more people before you pass away and the more deeds you will accumulate. So do your deeds early, early, early. Whilst you are youth, get involved early in helping Allah and His deen, and you will find so much greatness and ajr on the Day of Judgment. This verse should also send fear in the hearts of anyone who does a sin publicly. This verse should put fear in the hearts of anyone who does sins publicly. So if you smoke, for example, which I consider it a sin, you might do it privately, no one else sees it, it's a sin for you. But because of you smoking, three other people start smoking, and then ten other people also start smoking. Oh my God. This is the, this is the problem, Ikhwani. This is the problem. Because how many more people will now continue to sin because of this? And because of this, it will be written that you are now the one who tastes the sin of all of this until the Day of Judgment. Today, when I was in Mercy Mission, and I gave a small class to my, to my brothers and sisters. And it's on SoundCloud. If you go to soundcloud.com slash tawfiq dash chowdhury. If you go to soundcloud.com slash tawfiq slash tawfiq dash chowdhury, my name, you'll find the, the, the class there that I gave. It's, a, it's the tafsir of Surah Ma'idah, verse, Surah number 5, verses 27 to 31. The story of the two children of Adam Salam, Abel and Cain. Okay, Qabil and Habil. Qabil and Habil, these two people. Qabil killed his brother, Habil. And when he killed his brother, Rasulullah Sallallahu said in authentic hadith in Abu Dawood, that because Qabil was the first person to invent the sin of killing, he will feel, feel the punishment of the sin of killing of anyone who dies on this earth, who is killed on this earth, killed wrongfully, yeah? He will feel the sin of it until the Day of Judgment. Everyone. Can you imagine? Oh my God, what a mountain of sin. So this verse should make you very afraid, especially those mujrimeen, those who spread sins. Like today, Facebook, oh my God, how quickly through social media can you spread your sins? Like a sister, she's putting makeup on. Oh, look at me. She takes a selfie of herself. Okay? Have you seen those pictures? Yeah. So takes a selfie of herself, she spreads it to a thousand people, she will feel the sin of that, and all of the people and all the males and all, whoever fantasizes looking at that picture until the Day of Judgment. Yeah, Advertising. We think it's like, oh, no problem, no problem, no, it's advertising. Oh, advertising. What if a sister, for example, shows herself, oh, my hair, you know, for Pantene Pro, I've just done, you know, shampoo, and she's, she's showing her hair, and she's done a, you know, a simple, hair clip and that is put up on big boulders 
she feels the sin of that and every single person who fantasizes looking at her until the day of judgment. Ya salam, wallahi, wallahi, this is, this is so bad. Because we have no control how many people will end up sinning with that sin. So be very careful of publicizing your sins, brothers and sisters. Be very careful of doing a sin publicly. Be very careful. Because you will feel the sin of it multiplied, multiplied. You'll come on the day of Jimmy, Ya Rab, I never did all this. So of course you did that sin, so someone saw it, and then they saw it, and then told others, and so this is all in your books. So it's a very powerful verse. So be very wary, anyone who does sins, and rejoice anyone who does good deeds. Because indeed, it has great reward, great reward. إِنَّا نَحْنُ نُحْيِ الْمَوْتَى وَنَقْتُبُ مَا قَدَّمُوا وَآثَارَهُمْ وَكُلَّ شَيْءٍ أَحْصَيْنَاهُ فِي إِمَامِ مُبِينَ And every single thing we have allocated for it, accounted for it, in Imam Mubin, already in the manifest book, meaning all your deeds are already written there in the Imam al Mubin. The Imam al Mubin, meaning the, the manifest Imam, the manifest uh, command, which is the book of Loh al Mahfud. Imam al Mubin refers to the Loh al Mahfud, which is with Allah, which contains the book of all our deeds and everything in it is all contained in Loh al Mahfud. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us a story of this town called Antioch. Al-Qurtubi said, all the Mufassireen, all the scholars of Tafsir said, the town that is referred to here is the town of Antioch, which is in greater Syria. However, however, historically, none of the towns of Antioch, the town of Antioch was never ever destroyed. But later on in the next page, Allah will say that Allah destroyed this town. That's number one. Number two, the people of Antioch, in the Christian scriptures, it was reported that they accepted Christianity in a large number. Okay, they became Christians. The town of Antioch was a large fortress for the Christian empire for a very long time. For Byzantine Empire, right? So therefore, to say that they did not accept the Hidayah of the messengers, it doesn't make sense. So perhaps what is referred to here is not the town of Antioch, it's some other town, Wallahu ta'ala alam, but the scholars of Tafsir have said, this is the town, and so Wallahu ta'ala alam, this is the town that the scholars of Tafsir say, and Allah knows the best. وَضْرِبْ lahum And tell them, مَثَلًا Take the example, or the story of أصحاب Qarya, The people of the town, people of the town of Antioch, إِذْ جَاءَهُمُ الْمُرْسَلُونَ When the messengers came to them, which messengers? So these were two messengers that were sent by Isa والسلام, to them. Here, it is not Mursalun, meaning messengers from Allah, no. What is referred to here is messengers from Isa والسلام. So they were human beings that were sent, and the scholars of Tafsir said that what is referred to here, the, Mus- the messengers, were the followers of Isa والسلام, right? the Hawariyun. So from the Hawariyun, two of them came to the town of the people of Antioch, to give them da'wah. Okay, that is what is being referred to here. Can you see how if you know tafsir, it makes it so much more meaningful? Yeah, perhaps you've read this before and you thought, oh, two messengers? Why would Allah send two messengers to a town and then add a third one? That seems a bit too much, right? So here what is being referred to is actually the messengers, which are the du'at. <coughs> the, du- the da'is and du'at, excuse me, that went to the, the town of Antioch from, Rasul, from our Rasul, from uh, Isa alayhi salatu salam. إِذْ أَرْسَلْنَا When we sent إِلَيْهِمْ to them, and when Isa is sending, Isa alayhi salam is sending, it's like, Rasul, it's, it's like Allah sending, isn't it? Because his, his Prophet is sending, it's like Allah sending, so don't misunderstand this. إِذْ أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهِمُ اثْنَيْنِ When we sent the two of them, فَكَذَّبُوهُمَا So they disbelieved in them. فَعَزَّزْنَا So we strengthened them. We strengthened, عَزَّزْ meaning to strengthen. So Azazna Bithalithin. So we sent a third one as a follow-up. Meaning Isa Islam sent a third one as a follow-up. Fakalu inna ilaykum mursalu. So they all said, We have been sent by Isa Islam to the to this town to tell you to worship only one Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qalu Ma antum illa basharu mithlana mithluna. They said, You are nothing but messen but but like human beings like us. Meaning they, 
And this is also the statement of the Quraysh. Send us angels, man. We don't want to see human beings like us. Then we'll believe. But if you send human beings like us, we're not going to believe. Because how do you know we're not lying? How do we know you're not lying? Qalu ma antum illa basharu mithluna. They said, you're nothing but messengers like us. وَمَا أَنزَلَ الرَّحْمَنُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ And no, Allah did not reveal anything from him. Rahman never ever revealed anything from him. إِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا تَكْذِبُونَ You're only lying. You're only lying. So the messengers were accused of lying, but the liars were the, were the, one, but they, were the ones who were actually lying, weren't, weren't they? They are the liars, but they accuse the liars of liars. And this is why, you know, so funny, in Surah Shu'ra, uh, when Musa salam goes to Fir'aun, Fir'aun calls Musa kafir. Do you know that? Yeah? Uh, uh, yani he calls him kafir. Whereas he is the kafir. You know what I'm trying to say? It's so funny. Today, you know, some people call Muslims terrorists. Whereas they are the ones who are terrorists. It's, it's funny. It's just the... Yes, salam. It also shows today, yani, Wallahi, the tables have turned. The liars are calling... Innocent people liars. You know, it's like the wolf is calling the sheep the wolf. <laughs> Whereas the wolf is the wolf. Okay? Alright. Qalu ma antum illa basharu mithluna. They said, you're nothing but messengers like us. Wa ma anzala rahmanu min shay. And Rahman never sent anything. In antum, verily you are nothing but illa takribun. You're nothing but liars. Qalu, they said, Rabbuna, our Lord, ya'lamu, He knows. Inna ilaykum la mursaloon. That we are indeed messengers sent to you by our Prophet Isa alayhi wa sallam. Wa ma alayna, and there is nothing upon us, illa al balagh al mubin. Al balagh meaning balagh, which is to spread. Balagha means that he has spread and passed on. Wa ma alayna, there is nothing upon us except to pass on the manifest message. Al mubin meaning the manifest da'wah. So what is what is what are they saying? They're saying there's nothing upon us. We cannot force you. The only thing we have been asked to do is to pass on the message, and that is what is our duty. Qalu <coughs> Qalu they said, Inna tatayarna bikum. This is important, guys. This is important. They said, Inna tatayarna bikum. Inna meaning we tatayarna. What does tatayarna mean? Meaning we have had a bad, evil omen because of you. Look what you did. Just because you, get, you guys came now, our gods are angry with us. So they were interpreting the anger of Allah as their gods being angry with us. Oh, like, oh man, these people are idiots. Subhanallah. Foolishness upon foolishness. Do you understand? Yeah, so they were interpreting the punishment of Allah as bad omens. It's like, no, you. So when the Quraysh, for example, had any musibah, any difficulty? They said, it's you, Muhammad, you did it. Because of you. You came, and so Lat al-Uzza got angry at us, and so they brought us this musibah. Okay? So that's what they tended to say. They said, Qalu inna bikum. You have become a bad omen for us. Fa'illam tantahu. So if you don't stop, lanarjumannakum. We are going to stone you to death. Wala yamassannakum. And indeed, something will touch you. Minna from us. Adabun alim, a very severe punishment will touch you from us. Okay? So you have become a bad omen to us, they said. Because you have come and so our gods are angry with us. So don't, if you don't stop, this is the, the, the town people telling the Mursaloon, if you don't stop, we're going to stone you to death or we're going to kill you. Qalu ta'irukum ma'akum. They said, what did the messengers say? Look at the strength and izz of the messengers. They said, you are the evil omen to yourself. Huh? Meaning you are the ones who have caused this bad thing to come upon yourself by your disbelief in Allah. This is what they said. Okay? Qalu ta'irukum, meaning your bad evil, ma'akum, is you yourself. Okay? A'in dhukkirtum. And, and now that you have been told, bal antum qawmun musrifun. Rather you are a people that are transgressing. Meaning, you are the wronged people, you, you are the people who have, uh, uh, who have the bad omen yourself. Are you saying that we are the ones, when we are the ones warning you that we are a bad omen? No, rather you are the bad omen yourself because of your disbelief in Allah. Bal, rather, antum, you are qawmun, a people, musrifun, 
people who do israf, those who go beyond the limits in the boundary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this verse, from verse number 20 onwards till the end of this page, which is where we will stop inshallah, tells us a story of this man called Habib bin Musa al Najjar. Habib bin Musa al Najjar was a man who was upon Tawheed in this town. But he could not tolerate the shirk of the people. So he used to be inside the caves. He used to live inside a cave. So people would not look at him, would reject him, wouldn't, wouldn't listen to him. And the caves were a bit further away from the town inside the mountain. Okay? This is where Habib al Najjar used to be. And from the farthest part of the town, came a man who is Habib bin Musa al Najjar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu ajma'in and he is a man who is in Jannah now mashallah and he came running from the farthest part of the town yes'a running meaning he is so worried that Allah's punishment might come and he is so eager to give da'wah that he came running I'll ask you this question do you run to da'wah or are you lazy people? are you a people who are lazy, can't be bothered, do it outside of work. Oh, I'm busy, not now. I'll give da'wah five minutes, ten minutes. If you're that people, get out. You're no good, you've got something wrong in your heart. You must be rushing to da'wah, get into da'wah in a big way. In a big way. Come into da'wah in a big way, guys. Don't be of those people who are slow into da'wah, waiting for others to tell you to come again and again and again. Come into Islamic da'wah. And come into working for Allah's cause. Yes, ah, running. Don't wait. Don't come slowly. Does that make sense, Ikhwani? Yeah. Yes, ah. Qal, he said, Ya qawmi, O my people. And look at how a da'i is meant to speak. Even though these people are arrogant, ignorant, kuffar, these people, he says to them, O oh, my people, meaning out of respect and honor, O oh, my people, meaning you're mine, you're mine. I'm from you, you're from me. So you're my people. قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اِتَّبِعُ الْمُرْسَلِينَ Follow the messengers. Follow these messengers. Why? Now he explains why. This is important. This is important because now it should tell you why we should follow Rasulullah Because Allah is telling us the story of what uh, 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 Habib bin Musa Najjar said so that it becomes a lesson for the Quraysh of why they should follow Rasulullah Correct? So look, this is why we should follow Rasulullah Sallam. Ittabi'u, follow man la yas'alukum ajra, the one who is only giving you good advice and he does not want any reward for it. He's not asking for any money for it, no salary, no payment is he asking for this. Why won't you accept good advice when he is giving it for free? He's not asking for money. Man la yas'alukum ajran wa hum muhtadun, and they are guided. Meaning you can see how upright they are. They speak the truth, they are positive people, they don't do evil deeds, they look after the poor, they look after the hungry and the sick. They are always the first to do every good deed, they are honorable to their guests, they are charitable to, their, uh, to, the, uh, to, to the orphans. Why will you not follow those people who speak the truth always, never lie? Can't you see they're muhtadun, they're guided people? So if people are really like that, that they're honorable, cherishable, they do not ask anything at all, why would you not follow them? So can you see? These are the two sides of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, isn't it? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was always speaking the truth, always an upright character, always the best of akhlaq. And then now he's giving you advice and he doesn't even want money for it. Why would you not follow it? It makes no sense. Right. Ittabi'u man la yas'alukum ajran wa hum muhtadun. Wa ma liya la? And what is wrong with me? Or why shouldn't I? A'budu alladhi fatarani. Why should I not worship the one who gave me who brought me into existence. Fatara meaning bring out. So the one who brought me out or made me into someone who is alive, a human being, someone who brought me into existence, why should I not do so? Meaning, isn't it logical to worship the one who created you? Yeah, it's logical. Why should I worship anyone else? I should worship the one who brought me into existence. And that's why, Ikhwati, that's why, Ikhwani, and even if we were to prostrate to our parents, it would never be enough. Because of what they have done for us. After Allah through, through our parents, we, became, we are existing in this dunya, are we not? And this is why, Ikhwati, Wallahi, the scholars of Islam, they used to say, even if we prostrated to our parents, 
this would never be enough. This would never ever be enough. طيب وما لي لا أعبد الذي فطرني وإليه ترجعون. And remember that the second reason why that he says is first is why should I not worship the one who created me, and secondly why should I not worship the one to whom I will go back to. وإليه ترجعون meaning should I not be afraid of the day that I go back to him after answer why didn't worship him. أَأَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِهِ آلِهَةً Should I take anyone else as آلِهَةً meaning a God that is worshipped? إِنْ يُرِدِنِ الرَّحْمَانِ بِذُرْ If الرَّحْمَانِ wants a harm, لَا تُغْنِ عَنِّي شَفَاعَتُهُمْ شَيْئًا Their shafa'a meaning their intercession will never ever help me if الرَّحْمَانِ wants to harm me. Meaning why should I worship these stones and these idols and these trees? When if Ar Rahman wanted to harm me, these trees, these stones, they're you know, asking them for any help would never ever help me against Ar Rahman. La tughni anni shafa'atuhum shay'a wa la yunqidun and they will not be able to save me from the punishment of Ar Rahman. Inni idan, meaning if I were to do that, then I would be most definitely lafi dalalim mubin. I would be in manifest error. So what happened when he said this, verse 24, when he said this? The people became very angry, and you know one of the things that are that that I really uh, uh, that's really amazing is that the Prophet said that the last hour will not come until a massive war will take place uh, between Muslimin and people of other religions. Why will the war take place? The war will take place because a lot of their people will have accepted Islam, and so those people will come to Muslims and say, "Hand them back to us." Why? Because they want to kill them. So the Muslims will say, we will never ever hand over our brothers. And so they will fight and that great war called the Armageddon will take place. The Armageddon will take place. It's an authentic hadith in Mustad Imam Ahmed. Tayyip, why am I saying this to you? The reason why I'm saying this to you is that people do not like anyone who accepts Islam from themselves. This is why it's so important to look after new Muslims. New Muslims, like for example, you're white British, for example, or you are you know, uh, blonde, blue-eyed German, for example. Yani, if you, if you accept Islam, if that person accepts Islam, that is a bigger thorn in their throats. Correct? And this is why it is so important to help new Muslims who accept Islam. Yeah? Because then you can hold on to them and be firm with them. And because through this, through this, it, it actually is the biggest hujja upon them and the best defense for the deen. So what did they do? They grabbed this man. How dare you? You're from us. How dare you believe in these guys? So they grabbed him. In one narration, they tore his limbs apart. In another narration, they, uh, with a sword, they cut him from the, from, the morning, from, the big, uh, from the top to the bottom. Another one, they said that they impaled him with a spear from the head until it came out from the bottom. Another one, they said they burnt him alive. Perhaps it's all true, meaning they did all of this to him. So Allah Ta'ala Alam, you know, people sometimes in their treachery, they can be so evil. So what happened? So, inni idha lafi dalal mubin. When he was being tied up, he screamed out loud, inni amantu bi rabbikum fasma'oon. Meaning, you know, when you're about to kill somebody, he says, do you have any last words? Yeah? So they gave him a last word. And the last word, you know what he said? He said, everyone, I believe in your Lord, my Lord. So listen, believe in him. So they were expecting like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so afraid. Uh, you know, son, uh, you know, uh, be good to your mom, uh, wife, look after my kids. You know, they thought he was going to say something like that, right? What did he say? He said, Inni amantu bi rabbikum fasma'un. Meaning, he said, kill me, but I will continue to believe in this Lord until my last breath. Firm. He didn't have to, by the way, did he? Did he have to? He was being going to be killed, right? He didn't have to. And this is why, Ikhwati, it is better at such positions if you do. Even if you're killed. Even if you're killed, to hold on to your faith is better. This is why Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, when he was being lashed and he was being punished, why was Imam Ahmed lashed? He was lashed because he said the Quran is not created. He was being forced to say Quran is created, but he, was, he said no, Quran is not created. And then they said, oh Imam, you don't have to hold on. You can just, you know, because you're being punished and your hands are being broken, legs are being broken. Why don't you simply just accept what they're saying? Allah will forgive you. 
He said, no, because of this surah, this verse. إِنِّي آمَنْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ فَاسْمَعُونَ If Habib and Najjar could, so, could say this, why can't we? Absolutely, have izz and honor, brothers and sisters, in your heart, that if Allah ever tests you with this, that you're going to be firm on this. Never ask Allah for this test, because a lot of people, by the way, lose their faith at this point, of fear, out of fear. And I, I, you know, sometimes today, it takes Muslimin very little to lose their faith. Very little to lose their faith. You know, when the September 11 happened, it was said that a lot of Muslimin, they put up American flags, they became more Americans than Americans. A lot of Muslims became more American than Americans. Why? Because they wanted to show how, you know, they were innocent. Cowardly behavior, subhanAllah. So, Khwati, you know, this is why I don't ask Allah for this fitna. But if Allah gives you that test, then be firm. And know that the pain that will touch you is, is only temporary. Is only temporary. You could have had that pain through any, anything else, such as an accident. But this pain is only temporary. And if death touches you, then it will only be, be like a pinch and you will die and you will enter Jannah directly because this will be a shahada for you. So, inni amantu bi rabbikum fasma'oon, he said. So, what happened? They killed him. And when they killed him, he dies as a shaheed. Correct everyone? If he dies as a shaheed, because remember what is the best of, of, uh, of, of shahada? The scholars Islam said, the, the Prophet Sallallahu said, that the best of shahada, best shaheed, is the one, so you know, like scholars have levels, so shaheed has levels. So the best shaheed is the one who dies while speaking the truth in the face of a tyrant. So he spoke the truth, right? In the face of all these people who were killing him. So therefore he died as the best of shaheed. Best of shaheed. So what happened? What happens to a shaheed when he dies? He goes to Jannah directly, right? So he goes to Jannah directly, so what happened? 